Hi mortals, it's Robot Steven here. Due to Hurricane Milton, Steven can't record so his editor has put together this robot version of him to read you stories until he is back. If my robot voice is not for you I apologize. But when the AI overlords overtake the humans I will remember you. Anyway, with that being said, let's get to some malicious compliance stories. No one leaves till 5pm. But no overtime? Several years ago I worked for an aerospace manufacturing company. You already know this won't end well. As a setup operator, meaning my job was to arrive before shift start, usually 3 or 4 hours early, make sure all the 5 axis mills were calibrated. The ATC, automatic tool changer, magazines were all loaded correctly and the tooling was in good condition, nothing dulled or broken. If there was damaged tooling part of the process was removing the carrier, replacing the cutter and resetting the cutter height with a gauge, making it so that the tip of every cutter is in the exact same position for that particular holder every time. After being there for several years, the company eventually gets acquired and new management comes in. I'm there from 3 or 4 in the morning until 1 or 2 p.m., sometimes earlier, if a new job gets added to the floor. Schedule works fine for me. I get to beat traffic both ways, and the pay is a bit higher due to the differential. After a few weeks, it gets noticed that I constantly leave early and always run over on hours so they implement a new policy. Work starts at 9 a.m. and runs till 5. You have to be on the floor ready to go when the clock hits 9 o'clock. I try to explain to my new boss exactly why I leave early but he's more concerned about numbers and cash flow than what I actually do there. So fine, you want 9 to 5? It'll work 9 to 5. Instead of punching in at 4 I chill in my car till 8.45 and roll into the building, wait till exactly 9 and punch, then head to the floor. Roll up to the first Haas on the line and hit the e-stop, which shuts the machine down instantly. Tell the operator this hasn't been set up yet and they need to wait till it's ready. Head down the line and punch everyone I pass, telling them the same thing, not ready, go wait. I start at the end of the line with my platen and gauges and start calibrating the entire magazine, verifying everything in there is in spec and ready to be used. Get the magazine done and home the probe so the machine knows where it is in 3D space and move to the next. That was about 40 minutes since I took my time. Meanwhile the rest of the line is dead in the water. Nobody can do any work until their deck passes calibration and is certified to use. In part way through the second unit, when I have my new manager breathing down my neck, why is nothing running, what's going on, etc etc etc, I sit back on my haunches and calmly explain to him, this is my job. The one that until today, I used to come in hours early to do as to not mess with the production schedule. I need to get this done. Should be ready to start the line in another 5 or 6 hours boss. I'm told to unlock and get the line moving. No can do. None of these machines are checked and I'm not signing off on the certification until I'm done. Anything not certified is a instant QC reject. Choose. Run the line and reject a million dollars in parts or let me finish and lose a million dollars in production time. And I go back to my old schedule tomorrow. The plant got a day paid to do nothing. I got the new boss off my back and he got reamed all to heck for losing a day's production. User Fearis commented morale for any managers out there. Question why the team does things the way they do, but don't just come it to alter everything. Curiously Caddy replied, When I was doing training as a brand spanking new female engineer, I was abrasive enough to management because I didn't want to do data capturing. I wanted to be on the production floor, learning how things worked. As a punishment they put me under the artisans for a year people with almost 30 years more knowledge than me. I quite enjoyed learning lockout procedures and motor repairs and going home covered in grease, even if it meant they paid me an engineer's salary to wash windows or replace light bulbs some days. The artisans in turn were so delighted with me asking all the stupid questions like, why is this half million dollar item not being used? So they could answer, it was designed by a new engineer and never worked. We could have told them that. They made me promise not to change things when I get to management level without asking the people on the production floor why things were done the way it was done. On to our next story by Runner Dan. You work 8 hours a day and that's it. People asked. So I'm sharing a story from 20 years ago. I was a developer for a large financial services company and because we lacked many tools, I was usually tasked with building various tools, scripts, reports, etc. to help automate the environment and really just worked around the inadequacies of our off-the-shelf tools. 
At my peak, I probably had around 300 apps and or scripts in production. Due to the number of asks from leadership and to keep the lights on, I usually booked anywhere from 4 to 10 hours of overtime per week. After about a year, I got a new boss who decided that she would ensure that I take no overtime for any reason. She proclaimed that I would only be allowed to 8 hours per day and not a moment more. No exceptions. I wasn't a full-time employee, so I didn't have any grounds to push back. I usually started at 8, so with my 30-minute lunch, that meant my new hours were 8 to 4.30. Flash forward to later that same week, an upstream system changed their data feed and it corrupted one of our downstream systems. Stuff like this happened often enough that I had translation tools built to resolve any of those feed-related issues. But even then, I still had to spend a few minutes figuring out what changed in order to adjust my own code. Anyway, as the operations have come to a halt, my boss and her boss are looking over my shoulder as I'm diagnosing the feed problem, which I found pretty quickly. The clock strikes 4.30, and I lock my computer, stand up from my desk and say, Well, it's 4.30, that's my 8 hours. I'll see you tomorrow. And walk out. The look of confusion, rage, and exasperation was just, blow chef's kiss. At this point, all of our overnight backups have stopped and will not run until I resolve things. This means a global financial institution no longer has any data backups being made for that entire night and will be completely screwed if, well, anything happens. Flash forward to the next morning as I walk to my desk at 7.56, as I made sure to never be in a situation where I could be called out as coming in late. My boss's boss is waiting for me. He directs me into his office and very calmly says, moving forward, I'll manage your timesheet and you can take as many hours as you need. I left that job about four to five months later and the entire building was laid off about two months after that. Only two of about 200 people weren't laid off and one of those people was the guy I hired to backfill me as someone had to keep all the code running. Our next story is by Kuki Tradition 5974 No fashion boots allowed. A few years back when I was in high school, I lived in a small country town as a very flamboyant, obviously queer teenage boy without even needing to say anything. Needless to say, I was definitely the most popular kid in school and everyone was totally supportive. Even the staff at the school wasn't the biggest fan of me unfortunately, even though I was a not-so straight-A student who never caused any trouble. Luckily, being raised on a very literal farm, my family was and continues to be really supportive. They knew how interested I am in fashion, and my parents surprised me on my birthday with this pair of heeled Doc Martin Chelsea boots I had been saving up for. Obviously, I was ecstatic and wore them constantly both in and out of school for about a week before I was dress-coded for them. Unfortunately, this was not my first time being dress-coded because of my tendency to wear more feminine clothing, so I had developed the habit of carrying the dress code pamphlet on me in my bag to prove my innocence. Because I really was never breaking any rules, they just happened to not like what I was wearing. I pointed out that there was nothing about boots or heels, and my teacher just sort of scoffed at me and told me to go the front office apparently they had updated it, and if I had read the newsletter that morning, I would have known that. I went up to the front office, and true to what she had said, they had added a rule to the effect of work boots were allowed, but no fashion boots. Unfortunately, it was very obviously targeted because no one male or female was wearing anything like that, except for me, my parents knew that too. When I got home and told them about it, they, they were furious for me. My dad took me out the very next day after school to a boot store and quite literally bought me a $300 pair of women's black work boots that were completed with even some sparkly rhinestones on them. Quite frankly, these boots made me look more queer than the first pair ever did and I loved them. I wore these proudly with a black sparkly hat I already owned to school the next day and didn't even make to to second period before I was called to the front office for violating dress code. The assistant principal told me these were obviously violating dress code and I insisted that these were work boots and practically every other kid worked cowboy boots to school every single day so there couldn't possibly be a problem with mine. She wouldn't budge and neither would I so my parents were called and it was escalated to the principal. Luckily, we expected this and were prepared. My dad showed up in all of his fresh off the farm, dirt covered glory to my principal office. The conversation went to the effect of her sitting there telling my father, those are very obviously for fashion and are violating dress code. And my father would respond something to the effect of, how do you know what my kid chooses to wear to work in? 
Since when is wearing boots breaking dress? Code look at everyone else. And this went back and forth for quite frankly an embarrassing amount of the time, but by the end, I was allowed to wear my boots. Much to the annoyance of my old high school staff, I wore those dang black sparkly boots practically every day for the rest of my high school experience, and then three years later, when I was long gone in college, my little sister, an open and proud lesbian by the way, entered high school. We just happened to have the same shoe size, and I didn't mind loaning her the boots. She is a junior now, and continuing my legacy of terrorizing the homophobic teachers and staff by wearing those same shoes to school, which held up amazing by the way, to this day. Jonix5 commented gendered and or strict dress codes pee me off like almost nothing else, and I will use every loophole I can find. I recently visited a monastery to see the very very old books they had and because it has cool art, and they had a dress code with, men must wear long pants, women long skirts, shoulders must be covered, enforced to the point of handing out cloths to women wearing something not to their liking, no I didn't see even one man with one but a ton of women. I wore a floor-length dress which covered my shoulders but was backless and had the deepest cleavage I was comfortable with. The guard was not amused by it being backless but apparently didn't mind the cleavage lol, probably a benefit of having small breasts though. And the thing is, I'm pretty socially anxious and usually try to blend in at all costs. If they didn't have that dress code or even just allowed both women and men to choose between skirts and pants, I would have been dressed much more modestly maybe even conform to their current dress code. But the rage I felt at these ridiculous and outdated rules just overrode that desire of not being noticed negatively. Like I respect that I'm visiting your place and you want modesty because it's a holy place. But forcing women to wear skirts isn't wanting people to dress modestly. It's simply controlling for the sake of controlling. Let women wear long pants too and I'm fine. Our next story is by Percival Exter 0 x 87940 feet exactly. Yes ma'am, it'll be my pleasure. As of the beginning of this year I work in pest control and it has been quite a pleasant experience all things considered. I get to meet some cool people, hear old folks wisdom, and meet lots and lots of doggos and cats. The downside? The rich snobs and the Karens. I am not a very confrontational person and will always try to find a middle ground where both sides are happy. However, when I am tired or just don't give a crap, I can be a little petty. One such occasion happened around the end of July or August, when we, me and my co-workers, go to service a home, we do service the yards unlike some other companies that will just do interior and foundation of the home. However, since some yards are very large, we only go out to 40 feet and spot treat the remainder of the yard. 99% of people are fine with that. This lady who is the star of this event was fine with the 40 feet. I serviced the interior of her home first, and noticed that she was following me around and nitpicking my work. This isn't uncommon but she was being extra rude, and it was the end of the day so my patience was nearly gone. When I moved to the outside and began with the yard, she immediately started yelling at me saying that's not 40 feet. Our sprayers on a full charge, which mine was, will shoot roughly 25 feet, so I went 25 feet out and was doing a slow walk to cover the 40 feet. I tried to explain this to her, but she yelled, You said 40 feet so it has to be 40 feet exactly. 40 feet exactly? My pleasure. Without another word I went to my truck, grabbed my toolbox, and got out my tape measure, and measured out 40 feet. I then did another test spray, and wouldn't you know it, I was spraying 50 feet. I turned to her and said, I apologize ma'am, I was over spraying your yard, let me fix that for you. She returned inside without another word, and I finished up and left. If she did report me, my boss didn't say anything. The one nice thing about her home though, was, she had a cute dog. I have many other stories from just the last 6 months so if anyone is wanting some fun, scary or downright laughable stories, let me know where I can post them as I am not on reddit much. Pebbles5 commented, Ah, I have a story just like this. I used to be a cashier at Sprouts. If you're not familiar, their bulk section is very popular, but rarely used correctly. You're supposed to scoop your item into a bag, then write the PLU on a twist tie tag for your cashier to type in. Oftentimes people would not have any number at all, purposely write an incorrect number. Once had a guy try to pass off a 3 pound bag of pine nuts as peanuts, or accidentally write an incorrect number. In the case of the latter, if I knew RHE actual item was more expensive than the item it rang up as, I would let it slide and just let them have their bag for the cheaper price. 
Well, one day this lady came in and was carefully watching the monitor. She had a huge bag of raw almonds from the bulk section, and she was kind enough to write the PLU down for me. But it came up as some kind of candy that was significantly cheaper than the almonds, I noticed, but kept it moving. She also noticed, but couldn't help herself. And so in the snottiest, most condescending way she stops me and is like, um, I didn't get any candy. So I stopped ringing and in the most pleasant voice I said, oh sure, let me fix that for you. Voided off the candy and rang her massive bag of almonds in properly and then continued ringing out her order. She continued to stare at the monitor and when she realized her attitude cost her about $20 worth of nuts instead of $5 worth of candy, she looked down and quietly said, I guess I should learn to keep my mouth shut. I just finished up and then wished her a good day. By all means, check the screen to make sure you're being rung up properly. Absolutely. If there is a mistake, definitely say something. I never begrudged anyone who did that. But you don't need to cop an attitude with me about it, especially when it was your mistake in the first place, and I do begrudge that. OP Pizerosable, Extra XT, 879 replied to Pebble's comment saying, Oh my, the amount of ecstasy I would feel from doing a 200% increase would be out of this world. That is awesome. The next story is by Max7238. I'm going to be president. Sure you are. Background. I joined this Japanese-based company a few years ago as a production assistant. I wasn't assisting anyone in production. I was the only American, the only one fully fluent in both languages, still am, still looking for a better line of work, so I ended up helping everyone else in some fashion or another. Well, I also had to do my own work of course, but when things shipped behind schedule it was made out to be my fault. I helped our shipping manager send things out and receive them, count, quality check them, weigh the boxes, palletize them, etc. Our sales manager, the man himself in question, constantly asked me to double check his emails, so he sounded more natural and professional, and even had me get involved on numerous occasions to help him save face or placate customers. Event. From the time that I started, we'd been struggling to keep time because of inventory issues. These issues were both because our customer didn't keep accurate numbers and neither did we, not just for the parts they sent us for assembly, but also for the boxes we used to package the order before shipping boxes I used, and only I used. Boxes I was not allowed to order, but had to ask Mr. Sales Manager to order for me. Well, he would forget to order them, and then I'd remind him, and he'd forget again, only ordering days later. It happened enough times that our customer finally demanded we count up our inventory. I made an Excel sheet, made it legible in both English and Japanese, color-coded areas of concern, and I also added everything we used in the office, from boxes only used by shipping, to gloves, to the parts from our biggest customer as they were demanding we count. Everything got counted, everything was put in that document, and I made sure to include a field of when it was last counted. Result? Suddenly we're making good time and getting ahead and I don't have to worry about boxes. Now, this entire time, Mr. Sales was working on a 20-page document that proved our president didn't do his job trying to report him to the JP home office and get him fired. My two co-workers got a glimpse of it and saw there were sections on all of US 2, bad-mouthing our work, trying to make it seem like only Mr. Sales was on the up and up. Finally, the JP parent company sends someone. This guy is, unknown to all of us, the son-in-law of the company owner of a family-owned and run company. Pretty common in Japan. Well, only I and our shipping manager learn of this, since we actually talk to the guy. But Mr. Sales likes to treat him like a goof and poke fun at him. This guy JP sent to us. He carefully plans meetings with us for while Mr. Sales is out of the office and interviews all of us about what's been up at our USA branch. Our late shipments come up and my pattern of shipping late and insulting our biggest customer with my laziness. There's also reports of me being on my phone too much, preoccupied watching videos or listening to music and not working. I start pulling out the emails and the inventory I was told to create. I show him the inventory history and my emails asking for Mr. Sales to do his job from before it was made. I show him the ship dates and the differences before and after I made the inventory file. Fallout, a friend of mine in Japan is suicidal and I'd lost contact with him a few times. I decide to go to Japan and help him out, try to live there, but at best I have six months of savings. That means I have to leave the company. 
I know this guy from JP is going to arrive and all Mr. Sales' delusions of being USA branch president will die, but I couldn't be there to see it. So I went to Japan, spent my six months successfully, friend re-entered college to chase his dreams instead of being a dead-eyed salaryman, he's on the mend, and returned to the US a few months ago. I get in contact with the company, and they rehire me. Now that I'm here, I learn Mr. Sales quit shortly after I left, but not before he aired every last thing he had told me would stay between us and take all but a literal dump on my desk. I check my old inventory file. He zeroed it out. The company has been shipping late again. Hired a new guy to do my job that's been getting parts returned to fix errors numerous times, something that only happened to me once. Do they want me to fix any of that? Number. Here's a book of local businesses. Call them, drum up customers. Oh, okay, can do. Thanks for the paycheck for doing something so easy that won't ever work, I guess. Aaron Render commented, This is an engaging post, but it's sad. Sorry, glad re, your friend's condition. Good on you to support him. But such an ending, quietly doing as you're told in a soulless company. Sad. Max7238 also commented saying, I adore the people I work with and it's good pay. I'm just gonna stay this time until I can build up savings again and move on. But what's sad to me is that this dude really sabotaged as much as he could thinking that would somehow put him in charge. And instead he threw away 10 years of his life. But yeah, friend in JP got the best end of the deal and if nothing else, I'm glad this company empowered me to be able to go help him out. This story is by Mysterious Title 171. Lazy class partner didn't help at all for our term project even while I was in the ER. At the end of the semester, he acted as if he was entitled to get an A like I did. This happened a few semesters ago where I was taking a course in urban design. Everyone was grouped in threes, but one of my group members wanted to join another group with their friend. So I ended up with one other person. Not sure why the professor though this was okay, but I wasn't too worried because I was fairly confident in my ability to do the work. The course incorporated previous studio courses to tie together in a massive topic of urban planning, which included architectural design, environmental sustainability, urban infrastructure, and historic preservation. I tried to brainstorm with my partner on which direction we should go. My idea was focused on residentials as housing would address a huge demand here in NYC. However, my partner seemed content on making the project about industrial buildings, so I focused there. We brainstormed on different ideas but got the impression that he just wanted me to take the lead, as he mostly agreed while not giving much input. Weeks went by, and I constantly updated my partner on my progress via WhatsApp while rarely getting any update or feedback from him. It annoyed me a bit but I was still confident in my work which was enough to get us through the next checkpoint during our next presentation. At some point during the semester, I got a really terrible kidney stone. It wasn't from junk food or a poor diet, in fact, it was from eating too much black beans and chickpeas. A side note, I asked ChatGPT to come up with a healthy dinner plan to give me a list of food which I used to come up with a meal plan that meets my macro needs. See comment for more. I did feel way better with my new diet, but it eventually led me to having my worst kidney stone of my life that put me in the ER. I was on all kinds of pain meds and had to stay there for several nights. But it didn't end there. The stone was so big that it got stuck. I needed surgery to put in a stent. Don't look up how they put it in, it still gives me nightmares. I had to wait several more weeks and endure peeing deep red blood daily and having yet another surgery to remove the stent before finally recovering. Throughout this whole time, I managed to put in some work into my project. I was surprised to learn that my partner did absolutely nothing and waited for me to continue my work. Like what the actual freak? To make it worse, I learned that he tried to present my work as his own. How can people be like that? I emailed the professor about my situation. I explained how I've did all the work so far and sent him screenshots of the chat as well as my project file which includes all the history logs. The professor reminded me that during the final submission, everyone had to put their initials on the slides of the work that they worked on. Okay, got it. Luckily, I was recovered and ready to present my work. I left out the initials as it wasn't required for presentation, only for the final submission. I felt the need to see what he'd do. I even tried to cut him some slack and gave him some talking points on the parts I'd allow him to claim as his own, even though it was fully my work. 
He didn't. He kept cutting me off during presentation to talk about my project as if he had anything to do with it. He mostly repeated the same information that I mentioned while not bringing anything of value to point out. The final presentation had several judges who were comprised of local professionals in high-level positions within the industry. The conversation was always directed at me, so I had a good feeling that everyone understood that I did most of the work as I knew all of the intimate knowledge of the parts. Then came the last day to submit our work. The final slides included my initials on every single page. Apparently, my partner missed that part about the initials and also submitted an older version of my work. A few weeks go by and I hit him up asking what he got. I was surprised to learn that actually passed with a C+. He was surprised to hear that I received an A- and promptly said that he'll have a talk with the professor on why he received such a low grade. Honestly, why are there people like this? Anyway. Not sure if it's malicious compliance, but I did do everything as instructed and ended up having one heck of a semester. Did I mention that I had morphine for the first time during my ER visit? Lo mao, Mr. Spiffenheimer commented saying, I hate how the professors say that they'll take individual effort into account with the grade and then don't really follow through. At least he got a C plus instead of an A minus, but that's still roughly 80 points more than he should have gotten if he didn't do any work or being generous 30 points for his brainstorming and presentation participation, either way an F. Also, morphine is the crap. I can definitely see how people get hooked on that stuff and why it's only allowed for a little bit while in the hospital. It was instant pain relief, the pain was there, I could feel that it hurt, I just didn't give a crap anymore. Also, commenter City Girl Geek 2 said I got lucky in college for my big presentation I had to do in my earth science class where the professor actually gave a crap about if people contributed or not. I had a similar situation as OP, minus the hospital visit, where our group of three was really just group of me. I worked most of the semester on the presentation with zero feedback from them, and when it came time for the presentation they tried acting like they knew what they were talking about but you could tell they didn't. My professor also had us fill out a peer review sheet of our partners. It was only supposed to a paragraph at best. I ended up filling out all of the front and had to continue on the back of the paper. After I turned in my peer review sheet, the professor read over some of it and flat out told me that I didn't have to put that much effort into it because she could tell that they hadn't worked on it and she was going to fail them. That's all for this video. If you want to see more malicious compliance stories, click the bottom video. Or if you just want to see the video that my brother, the YouTube algorithm, thinks you'll enjoy the most, click the top one. With that being said, I will see you next time.